Hello everyone and welcome to today's business skills series. My name's Sarah Gonzalez and I'm from Redback Conferencing. Today we're talking about bouncing back with confidence, a panel discussion based on mental health and experience. So we all know that mental health disorders will affect nearly half of our population at some stage of their lives. And while these are problematic, we can also use these to spark positive life-changing events. And then we can start to uncover realizations and also reinvent ourselves. Today we're going to draw on our panel and the positives that they've learned from their personal experiences. Hopefully this will help to inform you and your colleagues when it does come to bouncing back with confidence. Just a quick note that this should be viewed as a discussion and not specific advice. And also, if this does raise any issues or concerns for you, there, are, there is an array of professional support services out there, including Lifeline on 131114. So today I'd like to welcome our panel and starting from the far side, we actually have Phil Preston and he's actually the founder of Collaborative Advantage. He was in the corporate world once upon a time and he's now gone to helping people and businesses engage with their communities in positive and meaningful ways. How are you today, Phil? I'm very good. Thank you, Great Sarah. to have you. Next, we have Samantha Brunskill and she's the general manager at Brunsley Park. So an entrepreneur, an advocate and a mentor. She was diagnosed with bipolar disorder at the age of 18, only a few years ago. She actually has now used that as a platform for positive change. How are you, Samantha? Very well. Good to have you. And finally, we have Julian Williams, a partner at PwC. So Julian uh, does actually know his own, have his own experiences with mental health, work in a high pressure work environment. He does have his own experiences. However, he is now enjoying life on the other side. So we have him with us today as well. How are you, Julian? I'm really well. Thanks, sir. Excellent. So we've introduced our panel. Now we're going to get right into it. So first of all, a recent report that was actually supported by Beyond Blue was actually titled The State of Workplace Mental Health in Australia, actually stated that one in five Australian employees have reported that they have taken time off work due to feeling mentally unwell in the past 12 months. And that is alarming for a lot of us. And I think some of us know people in those situations and some of us may not. On your personal journeys, and I'll start with you, Phil, what have you discovered about the intersection of mental health issues and the work environment? What's your whole past been like? My past, <clears throat> excuse me, goes back about 10 years in the corporate space. And I, I suppose what, uh, because I now work for myself and I have for about the last nine years, and that was part of the journey, which I'll get to. But uh, I found that I uh, it can strike out of nowhere mental health, and it did for me, in probably not as a severe way as it would for a lot of people. But I found it totally changed my view of what I was doing and where I fit in and it, it was hard to adjust. Um, what I found in the workplace was, uh, particularly at that time, there was, it was the thing you, that you didn't mention because we had this uh, acronym called CLM, a career limiting move. <laughs> and <laughs> yes. mental health, discussing it was one of the things that would fit in that category because that would limit your career progression. So um, I found it was hard to talk about it and uh, I thought if if I'm out there thinking this, there's got to be a, a lot of other people. Mm. And as a, as a final point, I guess that led me into disguising those mm. symptoms and not really tapping into a, any work resources or networks mm. that were there. Did you find this as well, Julian? So um, you're in the professional services industry, um, corporate, big. Um, did you also come across this with your experiences, the same as what Phil did? I, I think I'll answer maybe a little bit different to Phil. I... I took it on as uh, it's my problem, I've got to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I think for probably up to six to nine months was very much around, well, no one else needs to know about this. Mm. I need to work this out. I need to come with up my solutions. But I couldn't do it. Mm. I couldn't do it. And I finally put my hand up. And with retrospect, I should have put my hand up a lot earlier because the support was there. Mm. And it wasn't just the policies in the organisation. There are people there that care about you. Yep. And I think you've got to trust that, if you do the right thing, someone will look after you. Mm. And that was the bit I learned. I'm sharing with lots mm. of other people around that. Um, but on the other side is actually when you tell the stories about it, it actually helps others think about what they should do as well. Mm. And mm. 2010, Samantha, so mm. not um, a huge time ago, yes. was sharing um, part of your um, recovery almost when this all happened? Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, it was the last part of my healing journey almost. Um, 2010, I had the diagnosis. 12 months in, I decided to try and have a full-time yeah. job and I didn't disclose that I had just been diagnosed and that really got me unstuck at mm. that point in time but 
then 12 months on, I actually use this mental illness as a way to look at, well, I can let, this is a time to find a job that gives me a sense of purpose and mm -hmm. meaning. And rather than going into it full time, then decided to um, start three days a week and then move into a full time role. Mm. Okay, so yeah. quite similar in terms yeah. of your journeys there. Um, just before we go on, I'd also like to encourage people that you can actually ask questions. Any questions that you do um, ask will be private. We will discuss them in the panel, but we won't mention any names. So moving on, let's talk about the upside because today is all about bouncing back with confidence. So we do want to put a bit of sparkle on this and make it not so doom and gloom. Um, we all know the benefits for organisations if they do address mental health in the workplace. So we've all read when it comes to reduce absenteeism, to increase productivity, to so much more. Um, personally, in your experience, do you think there's any upside apart from this um, when it does come to mental health experiences? And if so, what is it, even for the individual as opposed to the corporate? Uh, do you want me to go first? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think it's more important for the individual. As my 12-year-old mm. my daughter says, if you can't fill your own bucket, Dad, you can't actually help anybody else. Mm. So, what a very well insightful. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> The, the thing that I learnt was very early on in my recovery was, Julian, you have the right to think about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think if I look back, I probably wasn't thinking about myself. I was thinking about helping my family, my clients, my mm -hmm. colleagues, everybody else. And as that journey progressed, it became, well, actually, what gives you joy? Mm -hmm. And then as I came back to work, one of the conversations I had around was, well, what's the return to work project look mm -hmm. like? And there was A, B, C, D, E, which intellectually were very challenging and interesting, but didn't emotionally get me. Mm. And then the last one was my gut moved. Mm. So I think there's a piece around actually the journey can actually take you to a different spot than where yep. you were before if you let it. Mm. And you've almost got to let go and you've mm. got to go back and find yourself again. Yeah. Um, which has been a really interesting journey for me and it continues mm. still. And was opening up for you as well, Phil, was this also something that gave you upside, do you think, in yeah. hindsight? Oh, look, definitely. I think it's, it's a gift to be able to come through the other side mm. because... Uh, look, I found there's so much more texture to be found in life. Yeah. Um, you go through life sometimes with highs and lows, but they're maybe not that large and you mm. don't realise they're not that large until you have bigger highs and lows. So to actually understand what other people are going through and have that empathy um, was a big plus. Mm. But for me personally, it was actually the trigger to reevaluate uh, what I was doing with my career. So I was in a corporate, I was on a pretty fast trajectory, but those there were train tracks there and I couldn't easily get off the train tracks. So mm. it made me question, do I stay on this journey for life uh, or do I get off the tracks? Mm. And I, I took an absolute plunge into an area I had no experience in and it's nine years on, it's been absolutely fantastic. Mm. So mm. I think there's a lot of upside yeah. there. I know it's not, maybe for everyone, it's not always as easy to point to the upside, but, mm. but I've had that experience. And from the other side, Sam, um, so you're quite a successful businesswoman, what's the upside for corporates in this or organisations that do actually invest in this, um, mm. whether it's just opening up saying, look, my door's open or whether they do actually have policies in place? Have you implemented anything in your organisation yeah. and what sort of upside have you seen from that? Yeah, I think that going through um, your own mental health journey like that allows you to be more understanding and have more awareness around the human condition and these things that are happening for your employees. Mm. Um, some different things that we've implemented is before our team meeting, we do meditation. Um, we also do a whiffle, what I feel like expressing. So having a one minute, <laughs> a one minute outlet for everybody in the team to actually express how they're feeling. How often do you need to time keep that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, just go. And again, we've got a smaller team there, but yeah. doing something like that um, where people can actually express how they feel mm. and recognising that actually... Everybody, everybody else on the team are just people. Yeah, they're just like us, and they have things that are happening outside of work mm. that will absolutely have an effect on how they perform in the team. Yeah. So having that recognition there um, has been very useful as well. Okay, have you both experienced any of this um, in terms of your own careers? What um, what's happening with Samantha? Yeah, it's interesting. You look at large organisations and there's policies and there's mm. rules and that sort of sets a, a foundation. But at the end of the day, we all work with people. Yeah. And the connections with people around what does your future hold for you? What do you want to achieve? Mm. And I think as Sam was saying before um, we, we started the session, the values the organisations have and honestly talking about those mm. to enable some, some honest conversations around how people want to live their life and their corporate role versus their non-corporate role is, is very important. Mm. Creating that space to talk about it is really useful.
definitely. Now, we'll go back to the organisational thing in a moment, but mm. first of all, I just want to talk about purpose. So I mm. want to go to you, Sam, because we had a discussion yes. earlier yes. and it was really about um, personal purpose mm. and what role that does play in this. So how did you find how did you find your purpose when you went through this whole journey and how can <laughs> other people, yeah. you know, learn from that? Mm. I think that the real trigger for um, getting this diagnosis of, of bipolar disorder really was that I had lost myself mm. and so it was really that self-discovery of who am I, what's the difference I want to make in the world and through that journey I really gained an appreciation for what a sense of belonging does for us mm -hmm. because only once we have a sense of belonging can we have um, and make that greater contribution back to a wider mm. community. So. As a business leader, as a manager, once I was able to actually figure out, well, what's my bigger why, then I was able to encourage that, well, first align that with our business vision, our mission, our values, um, and then encourage and facilitate that so that each employee is aligning their role to their bigger why. Because once they understand the bigger why behind what they're doing, um, it actually then trickles down to the performance um, of how they do their role. Mm. And just on that, Julian, and I think this sort of touches on your belonging and those people around mm -hmm. you, and um, I've interviewed a whole range of people, especially this year, and one thing that really does come up that resonates, I think, with everyone is having that support network around you and having those yeah. pillars around you. And they yeah. do say, you know, the top five people that you hang around and spend all your time <laughs> with, you will eventually um, become. Mm. How did that play a role in your experience with this? Was it about mm. eliminating people or finding out what was happening or did you actually have the right people around you? It's, it's a really good question. I, I had a bit of both. Yeah. Um, I married a beautiful woman and now I know why I married a beautiful yeah. woman. The support I had at home and my parents were just phenomenal, yeah. phenomenal. Um, I'm 48. Having that support still mm. was actually really important. Yeah. I think when I went to work, knowing that my, my partners and a particularly a couple of people had my back, yeah. I knew they did, but it really came, came to life. Mm. But I think as you move forward through that process, you find that you bounce off positive people. Mm. And I'm consciously now making decisions around, well, I want to go left or I want to go right. And I want to work with people, give me that buzz. Mm. And it's actually now I'm making those choices. Yep. Whereas if you're not making those choices, you get stuck in those train tracks mm. that Phil talked about. And sometimes it's not that enjoyable. Mm. And it doesn't need to be a big thing. It can be just what's a little project over here that then all of a sudden gets legs and looks totally different. Mm. So it's, it's not necessarily about the big plan. Yep. It's about the little steps that then can turn into big actions if you let them. But it is essentially planning. Right? It is planning. It's making planning? choices. Yeah. It's, and it's, mm. I initially probably thought about planning as, right, next 15 years, what does that look like? Mm. Where's the stop points? Where's who do I need help from? Whereas now it's as actually as simple as I said to someone this morning, you go out of your office, you turn left for that conversation <laughs> yeah. or right for that conversation. <laughs> it's that simple sometimes. Yeah. And it's just thinking of that, right? Yeah. Now, Phil, um, I want, want to really understand, because I know how important networking and networks of people are to you. Mm. I've known you for quite a while. Mm -hmm. When it did come to your moment, the catalyst, so moving from, um, you know, the high-flying corporate world to your own um, or organisation and running your own business, mm. what was the catalyst for that? And were your networks of people and those people around you, were they sort of carried over with you or did you just leave them? That is a fantastic question. Uh, I, I would say just to preface it and give context that my journey was around, I think I set myself financial goals when mm. I was younger mm. and had no comprehension of why that might be a good or a bad idea. So when I hit that point that I was seemingly becoming successful, I then started thinking what's next and there was a big hole in the ground and, and I <laughs> yes. fell into that hole yeah. and bumped my chin on it on the way down. Yeah. So that was, I guess, I think the trigger. Uh, in terms of networks, I think the reason I dealt with it somewhat proactively was because I had a close friend um, who had talked about their experience in seeing a counsellor mm. or a psychologist. So yeah. therefore I thought, okay, if it's okay for, for him, I'll, I'll do it as well. Um, like Julian, I had great support at home, that mm -hmm. helps. And I think out the other end, um, part of my reason for leaving corporate was I wanted to work with real people and real companies whereas I felt the culture I was in was somewhat removed yeah. from reality. So it was, I think, yes, there was, I don't think I cut away a lot of friends and found a lot of new ones. I think they just sorted themselves out pretty mm -hmm. naturally over time. 
Do you think, and you touched on the whole financial goals and the success piece, and mm. I've always, um, I'm always interested to hear certain people's definitions of success. Mm. Do you think just basic goals like that, Samantha, play a big role, um, even as a manager or a leader, mm. in you know understanding what people's definition of success is? Because, like you said, Phil, you had no idea whether yeah. it was right or wrong what you were thinking, and that can sometimes get people stuck. Yeah. Do you think it's your responsibility, Samantha, as a manager, to almost um, help people understand that? Absolutely. Mm. You know, I think that's one of the main things as a leader mm. um, and leadership isn't necessarily about the followers that we have, but the other leaders that we create. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually empowering each employee to understand that for themselves, yep. because then that that's actually what drives them to hit your financial goals. Mm. And if you're creating a conversation that isn't only about the financial goal, um, or necessarily the business goal, but you can communicate that in a way that speaks to that potential employees bigger why mm. then they're going to be a lot more motivated to absolutely hit and go out running to hit the business goal and in turn hit their personal goal and their bigger why. Mm. Excellent. Now, before we go on to the what can we do and how can we actually take something yep. away from this, yeah. um, just got a question here. So just um, I'll hand this one over to you, Julie, and what's the difference between regular work stress and unhealthy stress? And I'll let you all answer this, have a That's think a about really it. That's a really good question. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, probably, uh, I'm probably in the middle of re regular <laughs> stress at the moment um, yeah. and it's, it's actually my body now tells me where that line is. Mm. So there's a few, I'm going to jump into some of the answers. Yeah, but okay. uh, So if I don't go for a walk every morning uh, with the dog, I know my days are a little bit wobbly. Yep. Um, so I've got to get that out of the way. So that gives me an enablement that the, the body's now in a good spot. Yep. I then find if it gets too busy or there's too much going on and I don't have the space to go and do the meditation or to go and do the quiet walk in the garden, I can feel it lifting. Mm, yeah. And when, um, if I talk too fast, if I feel my chest tighten, yep. I then go, right, this is probably not a good spot to be. The old me would have ploughed through all that 100 yeah. miles an hour and it would have been seven days a week and it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> now it's about, actually, I don't feel right. Why? Mm. And I'll pause and I'll finish a meeting. I'll go back to the office and I'll, I won't get a coffee. I'll just go for a walk around the mm. garden. So it's just listening to your body. Tune, it's been yeah. in tune with your body. And I think letting go through the recovery journey allowed me to understand that your body is your best temperature gauge you've got mm. and you've got to listen to it. And do you think this, um, we were talking as well before, Samantha, about mindfulness and yes. the role that that plays in a lot of organisations. Mm. Do you think that um, it is our responsibility now to start incorporating that into our culture in our workplaces so then people yes. are in tune with their bodies? You know, we're at work more than we're yes. anywhere else. So yeah. is this the right time to be able to implement these sort of um, standards? Absolutely, but I don't think unless the manager and leader really believes in this stuff, mm. will the employees actually take on and adopt these different things. But I think that we have to. We have to make it okay for our employees to really look after themselves and mm. to not just plough through. Yep. But it's the role of the manager and the employee or our team supervisors to make that okay and really get that greater understanding. Because mm. if the manager's advocating for you need to have that work-life balance and they see the manager working seven days a week um, completely, yeah. <laughs> working themselves into the ground, well, then that follow-through from the employee just won't be there. Yep. What about you, Phil? Do you stress? Mm. Oh, we all stress <laughs> in, in our own special ways. It's a little bit corny, but I think the, the saying I love is if, if you're not looking after yourself, you're no good to anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to try and pick that up and force it. And a little bit like Julian and walking the dog, I find physical exercise yeah. is number one and I start the day every day with it and I don't know what I'd do without it. Mm. And when you say mindfulness, um, the challenge I set myself is to notice something new or smell something new yeah or touch something yep. new, and that's, um, now they call that mindfulness, but mm. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, you can, actually when you're under work stress, you can go for a 40 minute walk and not even see anything around you. Yes. Yep. And yes. that's not the right space, so mm. that's a little yep. warning sign. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just feel like breathing now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, I really want to get into um, corporate culture because we do hear this word thrown around so much. We hear about engagement. We talk, you know, hear about a lot of organisations doing things to, you know, enhance that corporate culture. But I really, really want want to speak to you guys about the experiences mm. that you've had or what you think organisations should be doing. How can managers and leaders actually be creating a culture that isn't just, you know, corporate and friendly and um, exciting for people to be in, but one that actually does support the mentally unwell? Because I know that there's a lot of actual tangible things that we can be doing, but then like you touched on, Samantha, it's also mm. that, well, 
you know, just being mindful and understanding. So how do you think we can do this, Sam? Mm. <laughs> it's such a big <laughs> question. <laughs> That's, That's why, why we get it to you. Time, right? <laughs> well, um, you know, I, like I've been saying, and I'll keep chiming on about this again, I'm from a small business background. Yeah. So yeah. the application of this would be different in different industries. But I really do think that it starts at the top. Yeah. I think it starts with the CEO and the managers and the leadership leader ship board, they're really being aligned in the vision cultures, the vision, sorry, and the values and then the values trickling down. Mm. Um, I think that, yeah, it's really creating that environment where it makes it okay for people to, to be mindful. Um, and then them different other little systems in there that encourage that. So like mm. I said, for us, we have the wiffle, um, we do meditation and things like that. Um, and we find that that works really well. Mm. Now, Phil, I know you've done a lot of work with um, various industries and various sectors as well. Um, it's all well and good to say that, and that's great, yeah. Sam. But, Phil, when it does come to organisations that aren't that nimble, so we're mm. talking about uh, maybe your large government organisations, maybe your larger corporates mm. that don't actually have that, you know, that, in, that visionary um, CEO mm. who's talking about mm. this, how do we make change in those types of environments? If you're, if you're that person, you're down the chain of command and you really want to make a difference, how do we start that process? Wow, but that's a big question yeah, too. Yeah. And I think, to be honest, I, I find in, in my role, because I'm not a 200-person consulting team, mm. I'm a one-person consulting team, it's finding what's going to work in that organisation at that point in time. Mm. It depends, for example, if you're engaged by the CEO, you yep. work from probably the top you down, will. but you know you also need the bottom-up mm. piece. Mm. Um, however, putting all that aside, I find there's a lot more to talk about purpose mm. and very few tools around to actually figure out what it is and, and put it in place. Mm. So my number one recommendation is to help your people work through their purpose bit because their purpose bit might be coming from work, it might be coming from what they do outside of work or it might be a bit of both. Mm. Maybe they're already doing it and they just don't realise it or maybe there's something they could be doing. And mm. uh, the other important thing in that process is to harness their strengths and the things they love doing, uh, mm. which sort of feeds into mm. what what uh, everyone's been saying so far. Mm. And, you know, just touching on that change for you, Julie, and um, do you think it is about, you know, making those making those things happen in an organisation or is it more about policy? How does this mm. all come that's, into it? Because I think really there's good. a big difference. Mm. You can have these policies, but mm. if you don't have people who are actually willing to adopt them and actually encourage people to talk, yeah. what good are the policies, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I'll <laughs> probably reflect on my journey around some people said when I was not, at work and off sick, well, part of your challenge, Julian, is your work's too stressful, you should leave. Mm. And I went through a journey of thinking about, well, is that the right answer? But actually, it wasn't the right question. It mm. was, what environment do you want to work in? And as a firm, we're going through a whole focus on purpose. Mm. And we've got a great purpose as a firm, but it's actually about what do the individuals want because the whole is only as good as the sum of the parts. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think to Sam's point, it doesn't matter to the size. Mm -hmm. You can have the visions and the piece at the top, but the leaders at every team level need to operate that mm. way and I think as we go to what's the one thing you take away mm. from this it's if as a leader you haven't got to your own spot it's very hard to then coach and help others mm. do theirs yep. and if we just get caught on the metrics and the outcomes without the values mm. being parallel you create an environment that is too stressful mm. and I think the other piece that we haven't talked about is where it doesn't work mm. how does it get called out Yes, because it's yes. the unconscious behaviour sometimes that actually has an impact on people. Well, that's it. Like, whose responsibility is this? You know, you've got HR, mm. then, it, you know, they might pass it off to the CEO. Then, like you said, you've got different departments. Are they all individually um, responsible? And mm. a question here which talks to this. So if you see someone in your organisation who you think might be struggling with mental health, how do you approach them? I think that's the big question here. It's like, as an employee of an organisation, I don't know where the lines are. And it's mm. almost like you need to be taught what to do and what not to do because it can be quite sensitive for a lot of people, mm. can't it? Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. I, yeah, I'm just reflecting on my experience as a manager 10 years ago, uh, now we have more, I guess, messaging around uh, checking in with people and are you okay would be mm. the classic example of that. Mm. I would say when I was in a management position, really not understanding this at all, that would be a haphazard process. Yeah. Whereas I hope if I was doing that role again today, it would be a regular Thing, mm. connecting in with people, just mm. at least ask the question, not expecting everyone to divulge things, but have mm. some, uh, I guess, pathways and knowing what to do when 
responses came back that weren't, mm. you know, that were showing a bit of stress. Yeah, I think it can be kind of counteractive though um, if we see fellow employees I and mean, then we feel that that is our whole responsibility. Mm. Yeah. I think that, you know, there's, there's that asking of the question, are you okay, um, and, and being there and offering that bit of support. But I really do think that then that almost has to be given and that responsibility handed over to somebody else mm. um, from there. Otherwise, it can be quite counteractive, I think. Where did you go, Julian? For help? Yeah. In your organisation or outside of your organisation? So if I'm honest about you, I went nowhere. Mm. Um, and look, we have all the policies and all the processes, mm. but I felt as a, as a partner in a firm, it's my responsibility to control what I do. Mm. And I reflect back and it wasn't an unsafe environment. It was, I didn't think I could do that. Mm. And actually, I'm not, that's not me. I'm not having this problem. Mm. Yeah. Um, and did you, sorry, did you think it was for other people, not you? Those, yeah, I'd never talked services. about it before. Yeah, yeah. It never popped up in any conversations. Yeah. And when I go for help, I said to my wife, I can't deal with this anymore. So uh, should we then, you know, we've got the policies and we've got the stuff, you know, when it happens, but mm. should we then as organisations be um, talking more about awareness yeah. and how to make people feel like, make them, make them aware of what's happening to them? Is there a way yes. that we can do that? Yeah, I don't know. Isn't it just as simple <laughs> as a leader, as a manager offering support that mm. I'm here for you and, and being just mindful? And if us as a leader, if we're actually in a mindful position, we should be um, in tune to our staff, yeah. if, depending on the size of our team, in tune to our staff mm. really um, and then offer our support that mm. way. But I think um, it's really, this can happen verbally. Um, Mm. Yeah, yeah, from the, uh, the top down. It's it's not yeah. it's not so much about the policies and everything. Yeah. As a manager, as a leader, do you actually believe in it? Because if you truly believe in it and you're in authentic in wanting to deliver on that, then this is going to pop up. Mm. Yeah. Um, you'll see this happening for your staff as a manager, as a leader, team mm. supervisor. Um, yeah. I think it's Phil's Phil's point before about you go for your forty minute walk, but you don't notice anything. Yeah. That walk around the floor. And you're looking at workstations or work groups or workshops and you notice that that person hasn't moved out of their office for a while. Yes. Or they're working really late. And I know they're busy, but actually are they engaging? Mm. Yes. And I think one of the things I've noticed as I walk around now, I can I can see things I probably didn't mm. see yes. before. Mm. Um, mm. And I think performance management is probably one of those areas that maybe we just need to be careful about mm. in that people may not disclose, mm. but they're struggling to live and they're yeah. coming to work. Yes. And actually, how do you create a safe place for people to say, actually, I'm not performing well, but I love my job, but I've got this shit I've got to deal with. Yeah. And yes. you don't want to have people moving on roles and going to different careers, but they haven't been given the space to say, mm. help. Yeah. It's probably yeah. the main one. Do you, so it is about that speaking up and mm. that sharing. Um, when it does come to reluctance, we've yeah. just discussed, we've discussed a few factors. <laughs> Do you think um, industry sectors, job roles, um, even sex comes into this? You know, Phil, as a male, was it harder for you? Does sex come into it yeah. as a male? <laughs> That's a totally <laughs> different conversation. Did you hear that? Did you hear uh, that? And I'm curious to know as to, you know, it is as big as what a lot of people talk about and there are yep. stats and there's a lot of research out there. But yeah. personally, was it harder for you because you were a male and you had to have this bravado? Wow, well, that's a good question. I can only... Answer it in hindsight, and I, mm. what I know in hindsight is different. I think what it comes down to is a personal and a corporate quality, which is humility, mm -hmm. about understanding that you don't know everything. Mm. And I think as organisations, if they realise they don't have a great system in place for this, they, they will want to improve the same uh, in your own personal life. If you know you're not on top of something, you don't pretend you are. Yeah. So uh, I would hope that every manager would have those qualities, and, mm. and maybe that's you're going to struggle to get it in a big organisation, but maybe that is your key challenge is to have mm. those leadership qualities. And I agree with that point. You, you said um, you as a manager can't deal with everything, but you've got to have a plan of action, uh, mm. you know, the, yeah. a plan that you go to yeah. because you, if someone discloses something, you go, well, suck it up. You mm. know, that's not going to be any good helpful. for anyone, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's not a plan of action. You've, you've got to have a really clear view of what's appropriate. Mm. What about you, Sam? Um, you mm. speak, you're a huge advocate of this. Um, you do a lot of public speaking on this. Yes. What's the reaction from people when you do get up? Because I, I mm. feel, I have a sense that, it, you know, it's obviously becoming a lot more known. People are talking mm. now about it. You know, we're talking about it. People are mm. engaging in conversation. What is the sense like from other people listening to you? I think that um, a lot of people, one of the big things I get out of it is that to see somebody on stage being vulnerable, mm -hmm. um, sharing their story, it encourages them, wait a second, maybe I can do this too. Mm. 
Like maybe I can look at this illness or, or other people that are um, going through these same things in a different light and mm. it empowers them and I think makes it okay to be vulnerable. Yeah. And as leaders and managers and people in life, we've always got to, or it feels like almost we have to put up this facade mm. and that in a job as a manager, um, as a mum, as a sister, we've got to be a certain somebody. Mm. And I think this is what mental illness is doing for our society. It's making it okay to just be you. Yep. And I think that by sharing your story, um, it, it allows and encourages and empowers other people to do the same hmm. um, and bring that sense of vulnerability um, into the way we live our lives, which is natural. Yeah. All the rest, I think, is, is faked and forced. Um, mm. And I think that's what it really mm. does. Mm. Yeah. Do you think it's been therapeutic for you, sharing as well? Oh, cathartic. Mm. Although it's been, it's been two extremes. <laughs> so the Are You OK team are fantastic. And, yeah. and we had the Are You OK Day um, back in 2014 and that was walking into work going, yep, it's all there, great, sitting in my office going, I just wish someone had come and asked me if I was okay. Yeah. And they didn't because I was ready to just scream. Oh. But then I thought, well, okay, Julian, you can look at it that way or this year, why don't you tell your story? And mm. we had a video conference set up. We had Sydney, we had Melbourne, we had Perth, and I'm sitting there going, I've told this story to sort of one or two people. I've never told mm. it to 250. Mm. I actually went a bit too far. <laughs> it was a bit too vulnerable <laughs> and it, it rocked me a little bit for yeah. a couple of weeks. It really yes. did. Yeah. But yeah. it just showed me where my personal boundaries were and I sort of flipped between the word vulnerable mm. and authentic. Okay. And vulnerable is maybe giving more of you than you traditionally would mm. but actually where is your authentic line and who are you mm. and what do you stand for and what you don't stand for. So yes. I sort of play them both together. Mm. I think some people look at it, you telling your stories, being very vulnerable but as we do this, this is the authentic us. Yeah. Yeah. This is not I'm telling anything because I yeah, need to. Yeah. And I think mm. the more we can all be authentic and feel safe to do so, mm. we don't have to have this webcast. Mm. And I think that's a <laughs> massive ambition to have, but it is mm. achievable. Yeah. Definitely. I think that's amazing. You know, we go back to a few minutes ago talking about these policies and these things we need to have in place, but just simple sharing, you know, mm -hmm. communicating with the rest of your organisation, your story, yep. sharing that, being authentic and the amount of people, you can't actually measure it, but we don't need to measure everything, There's do a we? Ripple. No. There's yeah. a ripple that goes on. Yeah, yeah, it just happens and, you know, you could have helped someone massively mm -hmm. that day or even more people. So I think that's something else that we yeah. should take out of these discussions, that yep. it doesn't all need to be written down, you know, no. in stone for your organisation. It could just yes. be simple things. If you have mm -hmm. an idea, just go and do it and almost mm -hmm. surprise people with it. Mm -hmm. um, another question, um, we've got a few coming here, but one that was answered um, in the pre-registration that did come through, which I think is something we should touch on. So um, Australian wage earners are reportedly some of the long work some of the longest hours in the world we know that um, yeah. what effect does this have on our mental health mm -hmm. so I'd really like to discuss um, the impact on modern work culture the intensity mm -hmm. the fact that we feel like we need to be at our desk for a certain amount of time mm -hmm. how has this impacted any of you mm. do you want me to go first yes yep. yep so I think the old me was getting into the office just after seven yep I was leaving at 6.30, 7, 8 o'clock, whatever it was, flying everywhere, mm. 100 miles an hour. I thought that was good. Um, it wasn't. Mm. Was it effective? Yeah, it probably was. But was it really effective? No. Mm. And I think sometimes we feel we need to be seen to be doing things mm. to be busy. Um, if, if I see people working late in the office, it's what are you actually doing and when is it needed to be done by? Yeah. As against, well, that's fine, I'll leave them to it. So yeah. I think there's a piece of calling mm. out that, that time. But I think one of the things we talked about before is we're moving in an environment where work is a lot more flexible and whether we are working one job, two jobs, three jobs, we need to have the ability to, to self-regulate. Yes. And I think if you feel like you're working late because you have to, then I think there's a question you just need to debate mm. with yourself first. Mm. So yet again, something else simple that we can do for yes. our employees within the mm. workplace, you know, why are you here? Is there a better way of doing things? Mm. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Phil? Mm. I think it's, uh, I was thinking about that elastic and, and mm. you stretch it and stretch it. So the more mm. you play that tribal corporate game, yeah. um, you, and I've been through this myself, uh, you, I don't know why, but you tend to elevate your own importance and your job role above that of your family and friends at times. Mm. You think this is what I should do. And then that, uh, that elastic band gets stretched further. Yeah. And the more you stretch it, the bigger the, the break. Mm. So yeah. I think uh, a lot of people... We joke about midlife crisis, yep. but to be honest, I think that is, uh, that's all from that elastic band breaking mm. and people realising the goals they thought they had were not really 
things that meant something to them. And when mm. it goes bang, it uh, some people buy a sports car, some other people have a breakdown. Um, yeah. Or, yeah. Do bo or do both. Or do both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what's a bit scary because, you know, we used to think of mental health as something that was a condition that we yeah. were born with, but we're all at risk of it now, aren't we? Um, and I think, you know, going back to your experience, Sam, and we were talking before, you're working at the moment in Byron Bay and it's amazing to get out <laughs> yeah. and, you know, be amongst the nat amongst yeah. nature yeah. and stuff Absolutely. like that. So is that yeah. something that you, you know, you're still working hard but you're yes. finding other ways to do it? Is there something yeah. that we can learn from? that absolutely you know um it was actually a week ago where i have been traveling and it's the end of the year so we normally um i guess a lot of people are making them plans for 2017 and i was really checking in with myself and getting quite harsh on myself with why can't i get these bigger projects done and um i just made the decision that you know what i needed to go away spend a week in bar and, and take the time out in nature because i know that works yep. for me Yep. And I talk to people about this and they're like, wow, you're going to Byron away, um, again? You know, you've been on holidays. But I had to make the decision that, yep. you know what, that works for me. Mm. Yep. And within four hours, I redid a sales process. I've done a, a marketing plan and, and things are working really well. So I think another part of that is you've just got to relinquish the guilt maybe mm. yeah. for some of these decisions and, and that works for me. So I've had to relinquish that guilt mm. and then follow through with that. So can I, I just say my personal off sites yeah. have been in caravan parks on the south coast. <laughs> I think I need to trade up to Byron Bay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're on your own, yeah. you'd like a little beer, just like, oh, yeah, yeah this is a life. Yeah. <laughs> there's, 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 there's little rituals, I think, that yeah. you can have in life. Yeah. But, and my, my little ritual was when I was off work, and I was really lucky. I, I had sort of 12 months to get mm. better, but I was in a bad spot, um, was I'd go up to the coffee shop and I'd take my Kindle and I'd just have a coffee. Yes. Mm. And I'd just sit there and I got to know the news agent and Susie <laughs> at the coffee shop, mm. and that's my little ritual. Yes. And if I'm, if I'm sort of, things are a bit wobbly, I'll say, right, well, Saturday morning or Sunday afternoon, I just go and have my little ritual and I yeah. think things through, <laughs> scribble some notes and then move on. That's great. Exactly. But actually taking the space to do that yes. for me, I never did that before. Yeah. Yes. Um, just on, you know, going through the healing process, mm. if you, yeah. I'm not quite sure if that's the right terminology, um, but <laughs> I've got a question here. So we have spoken about the bigger why, meditation, mindfulness and listening to the body. Um, someone online is wondering whether any of you see a place for our faith in sustaining spiritual presence. Yes. 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 It's yeah. easy. Great. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. And look, I've, I've had a Christian upbringing and I think mm. that where you fit in the world and your role and what you connect with, yeah. I think there's a very important place for that. And everybody's got their own version of it. Did you go back to it, do you feel? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's sort of, it's, it's part of me and it was, maybe it was a little mm. bit of me that got lost and mm. It's um, it just made me think in a different way, and that really is like the personal thing we're talking about because yeah. it's not something that your organisation is responsible for. But Correct. I think for a lot of organisations, letting people know that everyone does have a faith in some aspect, mm. and it's about them um, accepting that, isn't it? You know, when we look at the word mentally ill compared to mentally well, mentally ill has I, whereas well we. I actually or think. Oh, you're good. Oh, <laughs> oh, you're good. Oh, oh, my mind is blown. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I actually think that that sense of belonging, that I'm a part of something greater, mm. is it's the we and that we're all in, we're all in this together if it's at work personally. Yeah. I actually think that's the key to being well. Mm. Um, and, you know, this even sparks a conversation as to, well, what does mentally well mean and what yeah. is mental health? Mm. Because perhaps just when we're having a mental health crisis, that's just simply us forgetting that we're part of a greater collective yep. mm. and that we've forgotten who we are. Yep. And so we get lost for a little while. And the great thing with that is that then we can transcend that adversity and that mental health crisis into mm. remembering who we are and then hopefully making a greater contribution back to community. Yeah. So let me just, um, that's probably a good segue into this last question we have from someone. Um, once identified, do you think you can fix a mental health crisis on your own or is it something you're saying that you need other people around you, correct? Mm. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that you need that support base there. Um, I think understanding, I call them wellness pillars, similar <laughs> to you, um, but, you know, that sense of belonging, I call mm. it joining, uh, finding your tribe because once yeah. you've got that tribe yeah. around you, they'll support you then finding a bigger why from there. That bigger why I think really helps with the ebbs and flows of life mm. and then getting that sense of purpose from various different sources in case one of them falls over. Yeah. Um, but then understanding, well, what are them rituals daily, weekly, yep. yearly? Mm. Um, yeah. And really not 
not taking on the guilt for looking after yourself yeah. and, and setting them boundaries. What is okay? What isn't okay? How am I going to communicate them boundaries? Because if we don't know how to communicate our boundaries, then even though we've got the best intention to not be working late, if we don't know how to communicate that to our boss or mm. to ourself <laughs> and remind ourselves, then yeah. all them wellness pillars mm. will just fall away. Mm. Yeah. One, one of the things we probably haven't covered is purpose doesn't need to be this big thing mm. no. and it doesn't need to be a work thing. And obviously, that, that's really important given the amount of hours we spend in mm. it. But how do you, when you reflect on what gives you joy, what are the, what is, what is it? And for me, it was catering my kids' Aussie rules team. Mm. It was that hour and a half on a Tuesday afternoon where it was right. That just mm, took yes. me in a different space. And when it wasn't happening, I thought something's missing. Mm. So I've had to find another thing to put yeah. in because the football season's well. over. Did you have any rituals, Jill? Um, or do you? Yeah, I was a fairly structured um, way that I go about my work. In terms of, I guess, faith and philosophy, I think if you're very logical and is that le left brain, is that right? Mm. Um, that's what I am and, and uh, I get accused of being um, quite regularly. I think um, faith, philosophy or rituals can help you get out of that left brain space mm. and into mm. something a little bit more creative and holistic that you often need in these situations. And corp corporations tend to be pretty left brain by their nature as well. Yeah. So it's a parallel mm. there. Mm. You used the word creativity. Um, I'd never done anything in music other than mm. year two recorder, which was not very good. Oh, I but, hate this. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> you heard my recorder? <laughs> yeah, anyway. my, my year two was before you were born, but never mind. Um, I took up guitar. Oh. And I'm now playing Sweet Caroline. Nice. Didn't bring it with me, you I apologise. Yeah, <laughs> but that whole know. whole different part of your brain and different part of um, who you are getting opened up is just phenomenal. Well, it's funny because we always in the past have spoken about a midlife crisis as a negative thing and, you know, mm. this person almost teasing them in a way, whereas actually it's, amazing. it's, it's quite a good thing. Mm. Yeah. It's so amazing. excited for the weekend now. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay, now we're almost at the end, so any final questions, please send them through. But I really just want to turn back to our panel and just ask your number one tip for either mm -hmm. employers or other anyone, doesn't need to be in a leadership role, actually watching this, whether or, um, you know, it is a tip for someone who may be experiencing this, mm -hmm. or maybe it is, you know, for a tip for an organisation that does want to help people. So mm -hmm. I'll turn to you first, Phil. Okay, so I think whether it's a prevention strategy or a rebuilding strategy, this whole personal purpose thing is really important, but what's more important is having the tools to actually break it down and make it into something. Mm -hmm. And what I've found is that everyone is different, so you can't give people a, a recipe for them to follow and that gives them the answer. You've got to help understand what's going on in their lives or not you making those judgments, but giving them the tools to understand what's going on mm -hmm. and what this plan could look like and then that that could evolve over time. And that may involve peer group coaching or peer groups along the way, whether that's within work or outside of work as well. Mm. I think that's extraordinarily effective and I've found over time peer group support is, is a no-brainer. Mm. Yeah, that's my yeah. tip. Um, yeah, you know, I think that if a business is looking to really implement this and create a mentally well culture, that there's the opportunity to actually ask the people and really mm. get the people's buy-in with mm. that and how where changes can be made. And if that was done in an anonymous way, um, I'm just thinking that the people are going to know where the roadblocks are in the organisation, where the stress is coming from or what can be fixed. So I think absolutely involving the people in that process is helpful. The other part, I think it starts with you. Um, there's a really great YouTube video, Simon Sinek, um, The Power of Why, or it starts with why. Absolutely mm. watch mm. that. And then there's Brene Brown um, who has a TED talk on the power of vulnerability and so Seth Godin's um, Tribe TED talk. And they're three really powerful TED talks mm. that I think um, everybody will get a lot of good takeaways from as well. Mm. Mine's probably a bit more basic. If you feel wobbly, ask for help. Mm. And mm. that wobbly doesn't need to be that end of the spectrum. It can be right over here yeah. because actually doing that is the mm. first step to being the best you can be. Yep. Um, and you can't help anybody else about filling buckets unless yes. you're dealing with your wobbly. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. And I think, you know, when it comes down to it, we talk organisational, employer, leader, manager, we're all people yep. at the end of the day. And I think we just need to remember that. Yes. Have a deep breath. Talk to people <laughs> about it. Um, yeah. There was something I saw um, a few weeks ago and it was um, Jeff Kennett from Beyond Blue yeah. saying that he wants to make this KPI for CEOs in the future, which yes. I think as we move forward, there's going to be so many things like this coming about. So we really need to 
put something in place now mm. um, emotionally, physically yes. and also mentally to make sure that we help people and yeah. give them as much opportunity to yeah. come forward and help yeah. them as possible. So yeah. I'd like to thank you all. It's been amazing just to hear your stories and then hear your thoughts on how we can help other people online. So thank you very much That's for coming good. in today, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank it's you. been great. Um, so once again, thank you everyone online for joining us. We really hope that you um, at least got something out of today, uh, today's discuss discussion, sorry, whether it is for your organisation or yourself personally. And remember, if you do need any assistance with anything, Lifeline is always there on 131114. So thank you again for joining. Keep a lookout for the recording and we hope to see you at future events. Bye for now.